Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today in our free workshop about front-end security. As you know, this workshop is brought to you by Code Labs Academy, which is an online learning platform that offers highly interactive learning. It offers a variety of learning methods such as workshops and boot camps in different domains like data science, cybersecurity, web development, etc. So when you enroll in a boot camp, you will get access to one-on-one -on -one career coaching and all the educational content. You also have the ability of going through the learning content at your own pace. Now let me just give you some details about the next session we will offer. So the next session will be about the Blue Team track. Um, it will be like designed for the Blue Team career. The start date will be around the 1st of November this year. And here is the cost. Of course, the format will be part time. So you will have to study uh, for four sessions each week. And the duration is for six weeks. The time zone is, of course, Central European uh, time zone. My name is Amel Hamoum. I'm working inside CLA as a cybersecurity instructor and bootcamp lead. Uh, and I'm actually uh, studying the fifth year in computer science field. So your web applications front-end is the first part seen everywhere. It is the first thing that regular users and potential customers look at, but it's also the first thing that an attacker sees. Front-end security demands have increased a lot over the past decade, there are more sophisticated attacks taking place against web application frontends these days. Whereas in the past, most attacks were straightforward, resulting in easier detection. But more recently, attacks have become stealthier, harder to detect, and often um, discovered far too late. So in today's workshop, we will define two frontend vulnerabilities. Uh, which are about XSS cross-site scripting, and the second one will be about cross-site request forgery, CSRF. Um, and yeah, we will understand them deeply, and uh, we will try to take some practical session uh, or practical section about XSS vulnerability, try some examples, etc., how to uh, exploit this vulnerability in websites, etc. So yeah, without losing any time, let's get started. So here, as you can see, we have two types of devices. You can take for the client side any device that has an interaction with the user, like smartphones, laptops, tablets, etc. And on the other hand, we have also server-side computers who are responsible for the operations behind the scenes. So the client side is responsible for sending requests, like to retrieve some data, information, a web page, etc. And the server side is responsible for answering to these requests. As you can see in the slide, um, the language of communication is by using HTTP requests. Let's take the example when you are using your browser to surf on the internet. Here you are considering, or here you are considered as a client side. Every operation you are doing is considered also as client side. Then, your browser, for example, Firefox, will send a request to the server you are visiting, asking to create an account for you or to retrieve any information. The actions that the server is responsible for are considered as server-side. So now, after having this brief overview about these two terms, you should know that for a web application, we should have both sides. We should have the client side and also we should have the server side. And there exists vulnerabilities for both of them too. So for example, the server side, you can find SQL injection vulnerability, server side request forgery, which we call SSRF, etc. And on the other hand, for the client side, we can have uh, cross-site scripting, we can have uh, client side request forgery, which we will discover during this session. So let's define first what is um, cross-site scripting. So in this section, um, we will um, describe the different varieties of cross-site scripting, vulnerabilities, 
uh, and spell out how to find and prevent uh, cross-site scripting. So cross-site scripting occurs when an attacker tricks a web application into sending data in a form that a user's browser can execute. Most commonly, this is a combination of HTML and XSS provided by the attacker. But XSS can also be used to deliver malicious downloads, plugins, or media content. So an attacker is able to trick a web application this way when the web application permits data from an untrusted source. Notice here, it's from an untrusted source, such as data entered in a form by users or passed to an API endpoint by client software to be displayed to users without being properly escaped. And because XSS can allow untrusted users to execute code in the browser of trusted users and access some types of data such as session cookies, an XSS vulnerability may allow an attacker to take data from users and dynamically include it in web pages and take control of a site or an application if an administrative or a privileged user is targeted. Let's discover now the importance of the XSS vulnerability. So for this first one here, this first type, the more dangerous type of XSS vulnerability is where you don't even have to click on a link to execute the code. You just browse to some page on a site you trust and an attacker's comment containing malicious code that was saved in the database is displayed on the site and suddenly you and everyone who visits that page is triggering something they really don't want to trigger. Second type is um, if you often go to this website, for example, example.com, so this is a trusted website for you, and someone sends you a link of one of their articles that goes something like that. So this is the, uh, the URL the attacker will send to you. It will start, of course, with the example.com because it should be a trusted website. And then notice here, this code is added by the attacker from this ID is equal to. So this encoding format is added by the attacker containing a script, a malicious script to be downloaded just after you click on this um, URL link. So you will probably click uh, on this link because it's something you are really used to. What you are not aware of is that there was some code injected in the site without you or the, um, the site approval. And that code might steal your session, take some screenshots, activate a keylogger, etc. So let's understand the XSS vulnerability uh, with this um, picture here. So here we have three entities. We have the attacker, the victim, and the website. And notice here, this website is not the server. No, it's just the website of the victim. As you know, the XSS vulnerability is related to the client side. So this website is just the, uh, the browser of your victim. So here, the attacker will prepare um, a URL, like he will prepare a script, inject it inside the URL in certain um, encoding format and then send this uh, link to the victim and of course it must be a trusted website by the victim so just take the example if the victim loves cats so the attacker will prepare a web page um, or will trigger uh, a web page containing some cats images etc and he will send this uh, web page to the victim or the link to this uh, web page to the victim the victim will um, just consult that it is a trusted website, like um, he usually visits this website, and then um, he will click on this um, on the link provided by the attacker. But the link is not containing just the website, but also another script prepared by the attacker to be downloaded just after the victim clicks on the link. Um, the victim will see normally a web page containing cats or whatever, like um, his normal website will be rendered for him. And in the background, 
uh, what the victim cannot see is he um, he gives access to the script of the attacker to be downloaded on his machine and this script it depends on the uh, the, um, the attacker what he wants to do with the victim maybe this script will send some um, sensitive data from the uh, the victim's um, account to the attacker um, maybe he will send some um, credentials like the credit cards informations of the victim to the attacker so who knows um, what the attacker can inject in that script okay and just um, a remark the script will contain some lines of code like commands for example send this informations from the victim's computer to the attacker's computer and of course the attacker will make sure to include his um, his information, for example, his IP address and his port number, etc., to uh, receive all of these information sent by the script. Okay. So here, what you can do with XSS, in fact, when attackers succeed in exploiting XSS vulnerabilities, they can gain access to account credentials. They can also spread web worms or access the user's computer and view the user's browser history or control the browser remotely. After gaining control to the victim's system, attackers can also analyze and use other intranet applications. So by exploiting XSS vulnerabilities, an attacker can perform malicious actions such as the, the ones listed here. So the attacker can hijack the user's session. What we mean by hijack is just stealing the user's session. So, for example, one of the informations that the, um, the script will do after clicking on the link by the victim, for example, is just sending the session of the user to the attacker's machine. Um, the attacker can, of course, perform unauthorized activities, like I listed before. He can perform some phishing attacks and steal sensitive information. Let's now define the two types of cross-site scripting. So the first one is about the stored XSS. So this kind of vulnerability um, known as stored XSS happens when unverified or untrusted user input is saved on a target server. Internet forums, comment sections, and visitor logs are all classic persistent XSS targets since they all allow together um, or they all allow uh, the other users to um, access the attacker's malicious content whether they are logged in or not. Notice here, we don't need the users to log into the application. Even if you are not logged in, you don't have an account, if you access this web page, the code injected by the attacker will work or will be executed. So publicly uh, visible profile pages like those common on social media sites and membership groups are one good example of a desirable target for persist persistent excesses. So the attacker may enter malicious scripts in the profile boxes and when other users visit the page, their browser will execute the code automatically. Let's discover now the second type, which is called the reflected XSS. So the immediate return of user input occurs with the reflected or non-persistent cross-site scripting. So an attacker must persuade the user to click a maliciously designed link in order to submit data to the target site in order to exploit a reflected XSS. In many cases, reflected XSS attacks rely on phishing emails or shortened or otherwise obscured URLs sent to the targeted user. When the victim visits the link, the script automatically executes in their browser. So search results and error message pages are two common targets for reflected excesses. We will have an example with the search bar, um, with the search bar function just uh, after these slides, like to show you how to exploit if you have the excesses vulnerability in search bars so they often send unmodified um, user input as part of the response without ensuring that the data is properly escaped so that it is displayed safely in the browser let's now see an example to make it more clear for you so suppose we have this um, google site url 
So here is just um, a normal um, Google site we access all the time. Okay, so it's um, it's containing like uh, we are searching in the uh, the web page and with these um, like searching for flowers um, web pages. Okay. Um, and yeah, so the result after clicking on this uh, URL will will be displayed with this, um, for example, this paragraph. This is just a paragraph tag in HTML, and it will contain your search for flowers return the following results, maybe other uh, pictures, of course. Yeah. So the value of the query parameter Q is inserted into the page returned by Google. Okay. Notice here, this parameter Q um, is containing the, uh, this value of flowers. And this is um, a dangerous step done in any web application. So we never insert parameters in the URL. I will show you why um, following this example. So suppose further that the data is not validated, filtered, or escaped. An attacker could put up a page that causes the following URL to be loaded in the browser. So this is the URL the attacker will prepare. So it should be the same one, of course, because it is a trusted website provided by google.com. Search Q is equal to flowers. We keep also the, um, the same parameter. And in addition to that, notice here, we are adding the plus sign, and then here is just the, uh, the encoding format of the script that will be downloaded just after clicking on this link, okay? So th this is the part that the, t the attacker added to the URL. Um, and yeah, when the victim uh, loads this page from the, uh, the evil uh, browser or the evil web page, the browser will load the iframe from the URL above. So it will load this part here. So the document loaded will contain these informations. It will contain a paragraph, of course, because we didn't delete the, uh, the, the Q uh, parameter. This part is still uh, contained in the URL. So we will have the paragraph like uh, containing just um, your search for flowers, etc. Maybe other pictures, of course, because we need uh, a full web page. And in addition to that, notice here, we have this script, which means this script will be downloaded exactly after um, visiting this web page, okay? So loading this page will cause the browser to execute the evil script. Furthermore, this script will execute in the context of a page loaded from google.com. What we mean by that is if you have an account in google.com, imagine like this is just another web page. Like, uh, for example, you have an account in this web page. So when you visit this trusted web page and, you, and then the, the evil script will be downloaded automatically without the victim knows about that, this script will be executed on the, on the context of the web page that you are visiting. So imagine if you, you have an account in this web page and you are already logged in. So the script will steal your session ID, maybe your cookie, etc., and send it to the attacker. Okay? Um, maybe the script will change your email address and he, it will like have the possibility to because you are already logged in. So your browser will use the same session ID. Okay? We will uh, define all of these details in the, uh, the next examples. So, mashallah. Let's see now how we do um, or we exploit the uh, XSS vulnerability in real scenarios. So XSS is a really easy attack to start testing and seeing if you can execute malicious code. To get started with that, find some possible injection points in your targets and start with some simple basic payloads and see how that page reacts and then try to break it. So the easiest way to find possible injection points is to see if reflection happens somewhere uh, in the web page. A good example is by using the search bar and to see if, the, uh, if what we are searching of is just reflected or not. 
Let me just show you an example after that. So here, with this example of attack, um, this is just a challenge from the try hack me. We will try with it in a while. So notice here we have a search bar, and whatever we are searching here, it will be reflected uh, at the top of the page, okay, in the search results. So if you type here test, it will be appearing here, okay. That's what we mean by reflection. So if you are like um, trying to execute anything here, we will have a reflection of it. Once you have located a reflection point, it's a good idea to investigate it further to determine how information is being reflected, what is involved in getting information reflected back to you, and how you can get around some of the typical barriers that developers have put in place to prevent excessive attacks. So a good first um, try is to um, test if we have like or, or if the developers said it be before um, a blacklist or maybe a whitelist um, for some of the special characters. So the first step is to inject some of the random characters. So for example, these um, special characters here and to see if they are blacklisted or not. Okay. Uh, and yeah, this will be the first step to let you know what to inject in your payload, uh, like if they are not blacklisted, so you can use them in your XSS payload. So after playing around with the input field itself, it's good to check the front-end code to see if it is sanitized somewhere. Then check the JavaScript files that the input field goes through to see that. So. If you have access, of course, to the, the source code of the web application, you can check the JavaScript files to see if they are using a validation function in order to filtrate or to uh, validate, escape some characters or maybe some, um, some words that can be uh, like uh, used as user inputs. And yeah, this will help you to see what you will prepare for your um, XSS payload. Now I think it's time to um, test uh, with uh, the challenges I have prepared for you. So the first one is, um, yeah, this one is just about the, um, just for testing some payloads. It's a try hack me challenge. Um, yeah, we need to sign up first. Yeah, so here is just an example. And then we need to log in. And here we, we have an account in this um, website, okay? If I go to a new listing, this web page is containing an XSS vulnerability. So how we uh, should start exploring this is just by testing if we have a reflection um, in these input fields or not. So the first thing that you would uh, try is just this code. Let me just show you. So this is a JavaScript code containing the script tag, and here's the function that will be executed. So it is just popping up an alert, okay, uh, and containing the number one. If you change here, for example, you click two, um, you will have like two as a result. Okay, so let me just try with this. So if I click on submit query, you can see we have this alert pop up here containing the number one which means this web, web page is really containing XSS vulnerability. And this is just an example for uh, like uh, demonstration purposes. Uh, the attacker, of course, will not uh, like try to inject an alert function, no. He will prepare here a full script to be downloaded um, like um, by the users. Like after uh, visiting this web page, the script or the evil script injected by the attacker will be downloaded. And here we are just testing, for example, if we succeed to pop up this alert uh, box, it means that if we inject any script, it will indeed um, be downloaded, okay? Um, yeah, so if you find a reflection like that, you found a gold mine. So go ahead and break the whole site because there are probably a bunch more vectors possible. Um, and if the, um, the first payload didn't work, 
you can try another one you can try checking for the capitalization like that let me just place it here yeah so if the validation function is just um checking or um, yeah it's just checking for upper cases or maybe lower cases rating of script tag you can check scrambling between um yeah just switching between the uh, lowercase and uppercase characters and see if we have a reflection or not let's just try this yeah we have indeed a reflection which means it worked okay now if the um the uh, the first one and the second one didn't work you can try something to bypass the validation function so for example if developers are setting um, somewhere in the source code of this web page, a validation function. What we mean by that is just a function that is taking um, the input fields here, the user's input, as a parameter. And this function is just testing if these inputs are containing some excessive payloads, um, for example, some special characters and the, uh, the script tag, etc. And it will omit this from the, uh, the, the input. That's what the, um, the validation function will do. Let me just paste it here to make it more clear. Okay. So here, for example, if the script tag is being filtered by the validation function, which means if it will encounter this script tag, it will just delete it. A way to bypass this validation function is just to insert the script tag between two sections of the script, okay? Like that, and of course, with um, the closing uh, script tag the same thing so when we pass this input to the validation function what we will have as a result is just the validation function will delete this script tag okay so yeah we'll be deleted this one also because the validation function detects that we have an input containing um excesses vulnerability or excesses uh, payload sorry so it will delete the, the script tags and yeah, we have our original code that we wanted to inject um, in this uh, field, okay? And yeah, with that, we can bypass the validation function and to get um, the script downloaded for us. Now imagine that the, um, the validation function is like uh, the developers found a way to even if we use this uh, technique, it will still detect this script and it will um, delete it. Another way to bypass this validation function is not to use the script tag. But instead, we should use uh, an A tag, this one. Here, here it is. Um, so this A tag is just displaying a link to click on a web page. Okay. So that's, that's the result it will uh, print for us in the web page, correct me. And the function that will happen um, after clicking on this link or after doing some action is this one. Okay. And this one, what we mean by this function is on the mouse over, which means when we pass the mouse over this uh, click me uh, text, it doesn't mean like uh, we need to click on this link. No, just passing the mouse um, over this link and it will like uh, execute this function, which is just alert uh, one, just uh, popping up the alert box containing the value of one. So if we try this one, let me just show you the result of it. Okay, as you can see, here is the, uh, the, uh, the link click me here um, as I am aware of it uh, I don't have any uh, alert pop up but if I pass my mouse over it like you can see the alert pop up will be shown with the value of one of course okay so this is just another way to bypass the validation function there are many so yeah you just need to test them uh, in order to get the, uh, the, the one working for you Let's now see other examples using the, um, the second challenge. Um, yeah, and it is um, um, available in the Try Hack Me platform. So here I am admin in this uh, web page. Okay, 
and I told you before about exploiting the search bar so this is the area I was talking about if I type here test and click enter as you can see I have a reflection here containing the um, the search um, that I wanted to have results of and here are the results okay for example I have only one so what you can do here to test if we have an XSS vulnerability in the search bar is just injecting this code so it is an iframe means just a code for javascript okay and what it is doing is just this function the same one that we tested before just uh, popping up an alert but this time containing the xss um, string not a number just another uh, example so if i click on this search here as you can see we have um, an xss pop-up alert uh, shown for us okay which means this search bar is um, vulnerable to XSS um, payloads okay another way um, and yeah why does this work in fact it is common practice that the search bar will send a request to the server in which it will then send back the related information but this is where the flow lies Without correct input sanitation, we are able to perform an XSS attack against the search bar. Let me just explain this uh, more deeply. So here, um, it's about the function of searching. If we have any other results, um, uh, like um, um, given the same result as what we are searching in the search bar. So this input will be exactly taken from the search bar and pasted in the, uh, the, the JavaScript code in order to be tested to each item in the database, of course, because we have a lot of, uh, for example, um, um, items here that will be displayed for us. So it will just search and compare with the database if this item here is the same or not if it is the same it will be rendered here if not we won't see any result of course but if this input is not sanitized and uh, verified by a validation function it will be exactly like taken from the search bar and pasted inside the javascript code and of course it is a javascript code here while well, we are injecting here because it is a javascript code it will get um, executed automatically, okay? So if we are inserting here a malicious script, it will get downloaded, of course, okay? That's why um, this first uh, way of injecting the XSS payload worked. Second one, let me just show you in the order history. So here is just another web page, vulnerable to XSS vulnerability. If I click on this track icon, as you can see here, we have this ID parameter displayed in the URL. Okay, and I told you before it is a dangerous step to set um, or to show the parameters in the URL, and that's um, the reason why. So if I just copy the same iframe we used in the search bar. And instead of uh, precising the ID that was shown before, I will put here the script uh, responsible for popping up the alert containing XSS string. Okay, if I click enter and I refresh in order to send this request to the server, if I refresh, as you can see, we have the uh, alert pop up for us. And why uh, this worked, in fact, the server will have a lookup table or database, depending on the type of server, of course, for each tracking ID, I mean the parameter ID. And as the ID parameter is not sanitized or verified before it is sent to the server, we are able to perform an XSS attack, okay? So this code will be exactly uh, copied from here and pasted in the, uh, the, the code source or the source code uh, responsible for um, for testing if we have um, the same ID or not. And with that, it will get executed automatically because it is a JavaScript code, okay? 
and yeah with that we um we uh, we have like um uh exploited the excesses vulnerability in these two um challenges okay let me now show you some common bypasses so instead of using the script tag that i showed you before script that uh, will contain the alert function uh here are some other ways to bypass the validation function of course by using the url encoding format you can inject this code okay in the url um, link just adding the class and injecting this it will be considered exactly as if you are using the script tag because it's just an encoding format of the script tag okay you can use also the base 64 encoding this is just another encoding and there are many more for example the decimal html character the octal one also um, and there are many more as i said like uh, you can test them if the validation function is filtering or is um is escaping some of these uh encoding formats so you can just use the other ones okay okay let's now take a look at some of the preventions you will um, be using to prevent the excesses vulnerability so the first prevention would be to add some validation functions in your javascript code to filter and validate the user input and not to paste it directly into the code um, also you can try to use some blacklisting and whitelisting um, like this may help you to not or to eliminate some suspicious inputs and um, give access uh, to attackers to uh, like use malicious excesses payloads against your web application also you can use some libraries that are uh, ready to use provided by some frameworks if you are a web developer so yeah you can use these libraries to uh, prevent and stop any excesses vulnerability in your web application okay now let's get to the second vulnerability the second section of this workshop will be about the cross-site request forgery which we call csrf so an online flow uh, security called CSRF enables an attacker to trick users into taking actions they did not plan to take. So a successful CSRF attack involves the attacker tricking the victim user into doing an ac ac accidental attack. Uh, so for instance, they may need to do um, this to make a money transfer, reset their password or update their email address on file. So the attacker might not be able to take full control of the user's account depending on the nature of the action. The attacker might be able to fully manage all the data and functionality of the application if the compromised user has a privileged role inside it. So it depends on the, uh, the privileges given to the target user. The attacker can gain access or can take advantage from these uh, privileges. Let's see now how this attack works. So for a CSRF attack to be possible, three key conditions must be in place. The first one is about the relevant action. Uh, so there is an action within the application that the attacker has a reason to induce. This might be a privileged action such as modifying permissions for other users or any action on user specific data such as changing the user's own password so here in this first condition we mean by the relevant action is just to define what action we want to do with the csrf attack okay maybe uh it's about stealing the email address of the user target user maybe stealing his account sending some money from the victim's um uh, account to the attackers one etc so here we need to identify what action we need to uh, do with the csrf attack the second condition is called cookie based session handling so performing the action involves issuing one or more http requests and the application relies solely on session cookies to identify the user who has made the requests there is no other mechanism in place for tracking sessions or validating user requests so here in this condition we mean 
uh, by it is just um, being asked to uh, enter a session ID in order to get access to the user's account. Not like uh, having uh, or um, um, not necessary to have the username of the victim and also his password. Okay, so yeah, with only the session ID, we can gain access to his account. The last one is about no unpredictable request parameters. Here, the requests that perform the action do not contain any parameters whose values the attacker cannot determine or guess. For example, when causing a user to change his password, uh, the function is not vulnerable if an attacker needs to know the value of the existing password. Here in this condition, we mean by it is just uh, when the attacker will perform the CSRF attack, he won't need any other information from the user, from the original user. For example, asking him for the, uh, the, um, the old password, uh, maybe asking him for the current email address. No, if we ask him for these informations, we cannot perform the, um, the CSRF attack, okay? Let's see now with an example how we can or maybe before that, we can um, list what we can do with the CSRF attack. So as I mentioned before, we can change email addresses. Um, we can trans transfer amounts uh, between the, uh, the victim's account to the, uh, the, uh, the attacker's account. We can delete some records. For example, if we gain access to the user's account and this user is, for example, the administrator for the web application, so we can delete um, some entries from the database, delete some email addresses, usernames, accounts, etc. And perform high privilege actions as I mentioned before. So yeah, here is an example uh, in which we can understand more deeply this attack. So here in this above is just uh, about the HTTP requests, okay? So here, the HTTP request is about or with type POST, which means we need to uh, send data to the server. Here's the path to uh, do this action or to do this HTTP request. The host is the vulnerable website. Why we call it like that is because the web application is vulnerable to the CSRF attack because we are able now in this example to uh, perform this attack. If not, if the application is secure to this CSRF attack, it won't be a vulnerable website, okay? Um, here, the content type and the content length, they are just some details uh, about the HTTP request. And here, the most essential one is the cookie, okay? Here, we have a session ID, just a code containing some format, okay? And that's what we need um, to uh, perform this CSRF attack just a session ID, not a username and not a password uh, from the user or the victim. And here is the email address, okay? So let me explain what we do with this um, uh, request. So for example, suppose an application contains a function that lets the user change the email address on their account. So when the user performs this action, he will make the HTTP requests exactly uh, similar to this one, okay? So it will be post request, okay? Because he will send the new <coughs> email address. And of course here <coughs> is just about the, uh, the email, uh, the new email address that the, uh, the user will change, okay? And this meets the conditions required for the CSRF attack. So the action of changing the email address on a user's account is of interest of an attacker. Following this action, the attacker will typically be able to trigger a password reset and then take full control of the user's account. The application uses a session cookie to identify which user issued the request. And there are no other tokens or mechanisms in place to track user sessions. And then the, uh, the last condition will be the attacker can easily determine the values of the request parameter that are needed to perform the action, which means the attacker will not, um, like, uh, we won't need to have 
the uh, the old email address of the user no just uh, adding or sending the new email address is sufficient for the the action so with this the attacker can prepare this uh, HTML page okay so here's the uh, the web page the attacker will prepare just containing a body tag and here's just the form um, like, like the forms that you used to see in the web pages asking you to enter some username uh, your address your phone number etc and there will be at the end the the submit button to send your information to the server okay this is just the simple form you know here the action is to access this email or this um, url vulnerable website slash email slash change which is the same uh, listed here the method of course will be post and here as you can see we have this hidden input so we've typed hidden and this input is just used by the attacker to inject the new email address so this email address is the email address of the attacker not the user so the attacker with this is trying to change the email address of the user without his uh, permission okay and here is just the button of submit and of course a real scenario will contain much more information of course it will for example contain um, other inputs or other fields in the form containing some images in the web page etc this is just um, a short example just to show you um, how the uh, the steps of doing um, this CSRF attack okay um, yeah so let me just resume um, the, uh, the process of the CSRF attack so the attacker first will prepare a web page okay containing the this form and this information so of course the web page is does does not need to be uh, suspicious will contain some images like a normal web page and in this web page he will hide this input containing his email address to being changed okay and the attacker will make sure to send this the link to this web page to the victim and one more detail is the attacker needs to make sure that the victim already logged in to this vulnerable website he can detect that of course using some uh, some traffic sniffing tools um, just to analyze the traffic uh, for the uh, the victim's computer so he can make sure that the user uh, already visits this uh, this website okay after that he will send him uh, this web page the link to this web page okay and that yeah the user um, once he sees that it is a normal web page or for example it is a trusted web page he will fill this uh, this form and click on the submit button once he will click on the submit button this request will be generated okay so because we have here in this form this action and we have um, the the email as a hidden input so the the attacker's email will be put here and this request will be generated and of course it will use the same session id of the user or the victim not the attacker the user why because in his browser since he already logged in in this vulnerable website uh, when he will uh, like uh, open another uh, tab for uh, visiting the same website or maybe trying to send some request his browser will include automatically his session id because it is still uh, being used like uh, it is a new session id since the user already accessed this website for example on the same day yeah and after sending this, re this request to the server the attacker will um have the account of the victim with his um email address okay and with that he can just ask for a reset password and he can change the password of the victim and with that he can gain access uh fully access to the um the victim's account okay let's see now some preventions for this attack so the most popular method to prevent cross-site request forgery is to use a challenge token that is associated with a particular user and that is sent as a hidden value in every state changing from um, in the uh, in the web page. 
and this token is called anti CSRR token. So uh, this token works as I'm, um, I'm listing here. So the web server generates a token and stores it. Okay, and it will be, of course, a unique token specific for each user and for each uh, session. So for example, uh, it will have an expiration date, this token. Um, the token is statically set as hidden field of the form, so the attacker may never see this um, token. And the form is submitted by the user. For example, if the user will add a form, it will be submitted. And if the token is matching, the request is valid. If not, the request will be rejected because it's not the same token or the token has been expired. Uh, here are some resources about the, uh, the, uh, the, this uh, workshop. Just um, a page containing some of the XSS payload lists. It's available on the GitHub pages. So yeah, there will be a lot of um, payloads to test um, to see if the web page is vulnerable to XSS vulnerability or not. And here is just some other XSS injection list. Um, if you have any uh, questions about this content, you can contact us uh, with this email address. Uh, you can visit our website where you can find all the boot camps we are offering and many other um, details. Thank you for assisting to this workshop. I hope you enjoyed and learned uh, about the front-end security and see you on the, the other workshop.